You stand for the reading of the scripture. It's going to be only one verse, and all of you should be very familiar with this verse as well. So we're going to read in loud, one loud voice. Ready? Go. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Amen. Please be seated. When we really look at our lives, I think we could say that we feel busy. We are busy, it seems like. And it's not like because we have so many different schedules going on. Some of you do, I know. Some of our, especially our church ladies, they're just so, they're like busy bees. They're like just going everywhere. There's something's going on. Sometimes I feel like, are they really preparing for a war or something? Or Because they're just constantly doing something. It has to be done like right now. It's not like it has to be done today or tomorrow. It has to be done like this minute, right? I'm, I'm sure some of the men probably agree with me because uh, you've been tormented by your busy bee wife for many, many years. Uh, but not only just that our schedule-wise, but we're just busy because we're surrounded by so many noises and so many things, right? I'm sure every one of you, just like me, you have cell phone in your pocket, right, or in your bag. Right? So oftentimes, it's always near you. And some of you have your watch. I don't have smartwatch right now with me, but it's always alerting you. And then you have your TV on at home, and you might have radio, or you have a music in your car. There's a certain music station, radio station set. And now that you have a people surrounding you, and there's always white noises, right? So it's never a quiet moment in your life. There's no moment where you're like, you're not doing anything. It's just you're, you're left alone and just quiet and still and just enjoying the moment. Some of you said, oh, I do, but still there are certain things going on. Maybe in your mind, there's things that you're thinking, like, what am I going to do today after service, after Bible study, after fellowship, after Sunday? What am I going to do this week? Oh, I have to do my gardening. I have to finish this project, or I have to paint, and all those things, right? It's so busy. And it's not just one age group. It's every generation seems like, I'm sure that the teenagers are busy with their cell phones. They're always constantly on it. Or some of us are on the computer all the time or TV all the time. It's just busy. Constantly we're doing something or we're watching something, we're hearing something, or we're seeing something or experiencing something. And definitely we're, we're thinking. So we're moving, right, physically and virtually. Our lives are so busy that when it seems like we're not, we're not really doing much, but it's like nothing much seems accomplished Yet, it feels like there's so much business in our lives. You know, there are many great inventions, of course, in this world. You know, there are so many things. And I love watching movies and, and, and drama TV series. And one of the great things that I think was invented was the thing called the pause button, still button. You know, remember that VCR? You have that play button and stop and forward, and then there's that button that has little two dots. And when you press... It's not stopping, but it, it freezes the frame and it stops, right? I feel like, that, man, that's a, that's a great invention, right? I mean, I don't know who would think about that because usually you could just do the stop and you'll play. But some of you who know about, a little bit about VCR, you know that when you stop, it, it kind of changes the frame. So it, you're not exactly the same spot that you, you stop. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about because, um, you know, I love VCR. It's, you can't find it anymore. Maybe you could go some of the old yard sales and you'll find it. But what it does is it allows me to stop the movie for a second and then, then let me go to the bathroom or run to the refrigerator to get water or snacks or, or maybe some of you are like so scared they're like, oh, I need to freeze this and I just need to gather myself up and then, and then rewatch, right? It doesn't shut down, but it stills a frame so it's you left where you are and then you could continue on. So it's, but it's only for a brief moment. You're not supposed to use that button for like, Two hours or one hour. It's supposed to be for a couple of minutes for you to do little bathroom breaks or maybe you're, someone you're watching a movie with didn't understand, so you have to explain. It's like, so you freeze it, you, you still, you pause it and says, hey, this is what's going on. So you explain and then you continue on, right? It kind of gives you that little mini break sometimes. I know some of, you, some of you don't like that stopping in the middle of the movie, but sometimes we, we need that to catch up on. Being still is good sometimes. Because we are, as I said, surrounded by so many things. We're just, it's like a movie. For us, our life is just continuing going and going and going and going and never stopping. And that's why I think one of the spiritual disciplines that we really need is sometimes is just being still. 
When we face even trials and suffering, definitely. You know, when some of you probably experience that too, there's a million things that go through our heads. Like, what am I going to do? Whether it's a sickness in your family or financial struggle or just something happened with your children or different issues that you face. And when that happens, usually you don't just be still and say, okay, Lord, tell me your ways. Usually what we do is, say, oh, man, what am I going to do? And then you talk to people. You ask for support. Is there any backup plans? And all those things in, in your mind, there's so many things that are going through. Am I going to do plan A, plan B, plan C? And then you have all the way to Z, right? And you all think about constantly busy. And then we are just thinking about how we're going to deal with this issue. I think sometimes God actually had that, that pause button in his hands on every one of us. And he's like, stop. And he's oppressing us. Jake, stop. Be still, be still. And we're like, oh, no, no, no. we're just so busy and we keep going, going. God's like, just stop for a second. Stop for a minute. Pause for a minute. It's okay. You're not in control. I'm in control. So stop trying to figure out your life when you will never, right? Amen. Is there anyone here who could figure your own life out? Have you ever tried? No. But yet we try. We're like, I'm sorry to use, we're dummies. We're like, I'm going to just try to figure it out. I know what I'm doing. No. No one in the history knows what they are doing. They know what they're doing. Only God. But yet we're so busy bodies. Like we're so busy with trying to figure it out. And God's like pressing that button a million times. Like, okay, stop. Just be still. We finally stop when we try a million things. We think a million things. And then nothing works out. And then we come to church. God, okay, I give up. Nothing. Now I'm still, right? After what? A couple weeks after, a couple months later, even sometimes several hours later, you try all these things and then you are still. Psalm 46. It's about the, it's, it's about the writer of Psalms seeking refuge in God. From natural disasters and things happening to even foreign nations attack. And it's all things going on. So he start with verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So he's confessing, saying that he is the refuge, he is my strength, and he is the, not past, the present help in trouble. So God is with me right now, and I could run to him, and he'll be my refuge, and he'll be my strength. And yes, that's true. Our God is our refuge and our strength, and he is our help in trouble. But do you really know this? Do you really believe this truth? Do you really believe with this verse 1? Because often we do not live like this is true. Because we are not running to God, but we are running to other sources. We're thinking and trying to figure it out. You know, we just finished in our early bird uh, for Cam and Yen, we finished the book of Lamentations. Uh, the biggest issue with the kingdom of Judah was that they kind of knew that God was their refuge and, and strength through the history, yet they did not practice that. They did not apply that. They did not live through that. They did not live as God was their refuge or strength because they depend on other nations. They depend on their own glory, the beautiful city of Jerusalem, the Mount Zion temple. They thought that if you have that, they'll be fine. So they looked like they kind of depend on God, but they weren't. They were depending on other nations, depending on their own glories and strength that actually came from God, but they thought that they owned that. They said they're with God, but they weren't really with God. They just keep on going and going on, God, and God keep pressing the pause button through prophets. After prophets, after message, and didn't hear, and even Jeremiah saying, Oh, you're going to fall. You're going you're gonna to fall by the Babylonians and they didn't listen. It's like, oh, Jeremiah is lying. The truth is that we're going to win this and Babylon will fall. Yeah, Babylon will fall 70 years after everything has happened. They did not truly see the power and strength of God. They overestimated their own power and glory and they underestimated the blessing of being with God and God being with them. Psalm was... Psalm, which was written and takes a place much earlier than, of course, the time of Lamentations. But tells us this in verse 8 and 9, which comes before our passage. It says, Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes words cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the ball and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. So God is capable of bringing desolation on the earth. And we've seen that through the book of Lamentations. And also capable of stopping any war, any attacks, any trials as well. So basically, he's in control of the whole universe, this world, and he's capable of everything. And we are told to behold. 
and see the work of God. So then what? What comes next? The passage we just read, the command. Be still and know that I am God. What does that mean by being still? We just like, be still and then like, okay, I'm, I'm still. So I want to talk about four simple commands that I, want, I hope that you will kind of apply. So first thing, being still, most important thing is what? Number one, you stop. You stop for a moment. You think it through. Sometimes we live in a really busy life that we're so focused on going and going and going and going. And as a Christians, you know, God never tells us to go fast. Because speed is not the key in a Christian world, but it's the direction is the key, right? Where we are headed is way more important, what's the most important thing than how fast we're going. Well, I mean, if you want to really go fast and be with the Lord, okay, that's, that's fine, but that means you're going you're gonna to die soon, basically, what's happened. Or I don't think Jesus has planned to come, although I never know. You never know. But his point is not go fast, but go into the right direction, to the right way, right? Fervency is important. Passion is important. Sacrifice is important. But what's more important is what? Obedience, right? That's more important. I know that many of you make sacrifices that put efforts. But one thing you have to remember is that who is it for? Many times Christians, including myself, definitely myself as well included, we do things and we sacrifice things for our own glory sometimes. We do things for my sake, my name's sake, because my position in the church or my position in the society or how I want to look better in this world, so I do certain things. Sometimes we say, oh, I do this as a Christian. Or I'm a deacon, I'm a leader, I'm a pastor. Which is good. But before who I am, we have to think about who is it for? It's God. Before I come, God comes first. Are we sacrificing things for Jesus' name or for my name? My power, my fame, my glory to show. So how do we know that we're doing things for more for myself or God? After you make the sacrifices, if we desire to be really recognized and, and, and there's a sense of entitlement of what we have done, then that's a big sign that you have done partially maybe or fully for yourself instead of for God. And we all struggle. I think a lot of us struggle with this, including myself. Oswald Chambers, in his book, The Mind of Most High, has said this, and I have it in the PowerPoint. It says, The counterfeit of obedience is a state of mind in which you work up occasion to sacrifice yourself. Ardor, which is passion, is mistaken for discernment. It is easier to sacrifice yourself than to fulfill your spiritual destiny, which is stated in Romans 12, 1 and 2. It is a great deal better to fulfill the purpose of God in your life by discerning his will than to perform a great act of self-sacrifice. This is so true. Are we really obeying God? Or do we just love the idea of obeying that by sacrificing we say we obey? And that's a mistake that we know that King Saul has made. And that's why he was told by Samuel to obey is better than Sacrifice. And this is why we need to really pause and check and recheck where your heart is and what God really wants in your life. I hope no one of you are discouraged for what you have done. I know that many of you, all of you have sacrificed great things, and I'm not trying to put that in, in vain or any way. I know that our church, our people have sacrificed so much for the glory of God and God's ministry. But we always still have to be careful. And when I really usually speak, usually I'm speaking to myself as well. Because I fall into that trap. I fall into the temptation of sometimes trying to do certain things for my own glory instead of doing it for God. Sacrificing for my namesake sometimes than his namesake. We're not called to be religious. We're called to be faithful to God in his words through love. And that's why it's important that we need to stop. Stop from what we're doing. And the second thing we need to do is not only that we stop, but we then we drop. Drop what? So be still in Psalm 46.10 means that still the word Hebrew means that sink, relax, being alone, or become helpless. Or some other definition is sink down, or a drop of hands, or let the hands drop whatever you have on hold. Let go, withdraw, refrain from. I hope you get the message. Drop your agenda. 
Drop your will. Drop your plan. Drop whatever you've been holding you think that is yours or you think that is you're doing it for God. You know, I remember there are times that as kids, you know, as me and my brother, we're trying to do things for parents or mom and help them. So we ch- sometimes go into the kitchen and do and big mistake. But, and we start to doing. And then mom walks into the kitchen and says, what are you guys doing? And at that point, we, we freeze. Like, okay. And she's like, stop. And then what does it say? Drop whatever you have in your hands. Of course, as long as it's not something that breaks. Why? Because she wants us not only stop from what we're doing, that's important, but she wants us to walk away from whatever we're trying to do, right? So we need to drop whatever it was sometimes, you know, trying to make something or clean up, not helps. So she says, leave that and, and walk away, right? Whether it's tool, whether it's ingredient, she said, drop and walk away. We need to learn to come before God and not just stop for a moment. Be still is not just you be still and say, God, I'm still. But whatever we had the agenda, whatever the plan that you thought you're going to go through with, or whatever you thought that you figured out, God, I figured it out, so I'm going to go with this. And God says, stop and drop it. Because I'm about to tell you. Be still. It allows us to surrender all, even if the ideas you have. You really have to be still and, and ask God. Even if you are sure, you sometimes still have to be still and check every time. Even Jesus, I'm sure he was certain of his mission. I'm sure he's certain of what he had to do. I mean, he's, he knew more than any of us or the word of God. But what did he do? Every time, every occasion, every chance he had, he paused from ministry. He walked away from disciples and do what? Pray. What, what was he praying for? Like, God, help me? No, he said, God, what is your will? What should I do? Because he knew that he would be tempted by these people, these crowd, because they're trying to pr- praise him and worship him. And just like, no, we need to, I'm going to have to lead them to God. And it's not about me. I'm here to do the mission that God has given me. So that's why he will take that time, pause, that break, and he will go and he will talk to God. He spent time with God. Maybe for an hour, maybe half day, maybe early morning briefly. So that he will be still, be still before God. He sank down before God. He relaxed. He was alone. We remember the Garden of Gethsemane, his prayer. He became helpless before God. There will be all of God and none of him. He dropped of his hands and he let down. He dropped his hand and says, God, let your will be done. Not my will. And he sought after God's will to make sure and check and recheck. Because it's so easy to strive for your own will and your own glory. Jesus was not interested in studying his own kingdom, but he, was, he wanted to, his desire was for God's kingdom to come upon this earth through his sacrifice, his death and resurrection, so that his kingdom will expand. Because that already existed. And he came upon this world through Jesus Christ. And that's why we need to stop and we need to drop what we are trying to do or what we thought that we had figured it out. And then third thing is what? No. Number three, you need to know. Pause and then, because it says, be still and know that I am your God. So it's important that you stop, be still, and drop everything, and that you know. See who is leading in your life. You you're, you're, you're pause for God. Stop and seek God. Because there's so much noise, there's so many things, so many distractions. You look at computers and TV and people and there's so many things. And sometimes you're just so many voices and million thoughts. And so what you have to do is you need to stop, you drop everything, and then you simply know, not Pastor Jake, not church, not people, but God. Sometimes you might wonder, do I just be quiet and not move and, and just pause and, and then look up and God will speak to me kind of thing? Why do I have to do that? You know, as you know, I'm, I'm a sports fanatic, and, and, and I watch sports, and sometimes they're trying to find any good principles that even God teaches. And, you know, if you look at all team sports, uh, maybe I could be wrong, but all team sports have breaks. You know, you don't, no one plays full hour. There is always for football, there is first quarter, second quarter, and there's halftime, third, fourth. Same with basketball, right? And, and baseball, definitely, they have nine innings. There's halftime. There is breaks. Why? Sometimes, yes, athletes need breaks. But what do they do in halftime? They gather, they go to a room, right? And all the players sit down. And do they just chat around? 
No, they, they chat around and then they stop when who walks in? Their coach, their head coach, the leader comes in and they listen. And the coach said, hey, this is what you've been do- doing wrong or this is what you've been doing right. So continue with what you've been doing right and stop what you're doing and, and do this and this and they will do that, right? In the game of baseball, they don't have halftime, right? They have innings. But, you know, I don't know if you really know much about baseball, but every time batter goes to the box, they look at the coach, third base coach. Why? Because the third base coach really receives a um, sign from manager, which is do you need to bunt, sacrifice fly, just swing because your first base runner is trying to steal. So he will go on the stage and he will look at and he will give you a sign. So every moment he goes up, he will pause. He's not trying to figure it out unless you're like a superstar player and you figure it out. Game's already going well, so you, don't, you, don't, you, you could do whatever you want. But still, there's a sign comes. So he will pause and he will look at the coach and says, he understand. Now, if he mess up the sign, what's going to happen? After the inning's over, he'll be called and says, hey, you got the wrong sign. This is what the sign is telling you. And that's what, what knowing God means. It's not like, okay, I think I know who God is. No, you need to understand how God speaks to you, His language, and what He really desires to, to you to understand. Knowing means what? Yada, which is not just know, but it's learn to know. You're learning to know God. Not just a factual stuff, but understand as a person. Because I know some of you, but I don't know some of you like personally. I know of you and, and where you live, and, and it's simple. I could look up too. I know who you, who's your wife is, you know him, and all those things. But for me to really know you, I have to spend time and know how you speak, your culture, and all those manners. And that's what the author is saying. No, learn to know who our God is, whether it's through the scripture or through this prayer and spending time with God. Because how would you know what he's saying when you have no interest in his language? And I'm not talking about Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, all these languages. I'm talking about how God speaks through through people or through others or to you through scriptures in many other ways. Are you interested to learn to know him? And know what? Okay, okay. oh, we understand God. Okay, No, God, Elohim, means what? Divine ruler, judge. He is a ruler of all universe. He's a sovereign Lord, which means what? He is your God. He is a true ruler and Lord, which means that you're not the ruler. You're not the Lord. You're not the center. God is. So know that God is your ruler. God is the center. And he will tell you what to do. He will lead you. Now you try to figure it out. Right? And that's what we need to be still and find out. Our coach, our manager, our mentor, or our ruler, our sovereign Lord, God is telling us, showing us signs, but we're like, oh God, okay, that looks good, but you do your own things. And of course, the way to God is through Jesus Christ, right? He's the way and the truth and the life, right? No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. But do we follow Him, His ways? Stopping, pausing, being still. In order for you to be still, you need to stop. Even in the midday or in the morning or the evening. And I'm talking about not just your sins. I'm talking about your patterns. I'm talking about your lifestyle. Even you have to rethink or even how you serve. You know, even for me, what I try to do is, you know, I've been serving in the ministry for over 20 years, but still... I need to stop and say, am I doing it right? Am I, is this the right way or is it my way? Because I'm used to doing a certain way in different church or different places. There are times that I've been going mission. I've been going world changers when I was in Texas for so many years. So I went six, seven straight years. And I realized that on the sixth or seventh year and I'm there, I know the schedule. I know how things work. I know more than the staff because I went every single year with my youth. I take 20, 30 youth to world changers. And then at that point, someone was struggling. They were, I think he was getting sick. And, and they hit me, thinking, wow, Jake, you think that you figure it out, that everything is, is in your control? Guess what? Even if you've been to mission this many times, if you've been a pastor this many times, you think that you know the ministry, guess what? You still need to turn to me and pray and ask for your, my guidance. That's what God was telling me. They hit me. Because I thought that because I've done it all, I've seen it all, I feel like, and I experienced it, so I was like, oh, I know how it's going to work. And God says, no, you still need to depend on me. Even the simple thing that you think that you figured it out, simple thing that you know how to do, still you need to ask me why? Because God is my Lord, not myself. And that's why I need to know, constantly remind me that he is 
the Lord. He is my God. He's a sinner. And I'm just the vessel. I'm just trying to be used by him. I'm just following him. And that's what we need to really understand. And then what? Number four. We need to see. We need to learn to know God and to see how he does things. It says, second part of the verse uh, 10 says this, I will be exalted among all the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. We need to see and experience how great our God is. God will be exalted among the nations. He'll be exalted on the earth. What does that mean? Whether we take the part in that or not. He does not need to be acknowledged by us to be great. He's already great. He's already awesome. He's already sovereign. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need our approvals or acknowledgement to, to, to see that he's God. He's a great God. No, he's already great as he is. As I've said many times before, we are the only creation, I think, that goes against God's will and disobey. When you look at all these creations that God has done, all the natures, all, even all the animals and all those things, they work, they live according to God's purpose. Yes, you might say that those are animal with living with their animal instinct, but that's how God created us them to be. But God didn't care us to be sinners. God created us as a what perfect creation yet we just have to go our own ways and break the law and disobey god and do our own things because all of a sudden we think that we are god and we are the center if you look at everything else i'm sure many of you have been to many national parks and beautiful mountain scenery all around the world everything all every nature every creation points to what that god is great god is beautiful it's all about god it's only us saying oh yeah god is great but i'm great I have something to offer. I figure it out. I know what I'm doing. I'm sure that all the creation in the world, mountains and rivers and animals, they could speak. They're, they're laughing at us like, wow, you're so dumb. You think that you know when there's God, creator God. But we live and act like we have figured it out. We have know all because I live this nowhere. I've studied this much or I know scripture or I know this. That's great. But we need to turn to him. Because often I'm the main person. I'm the main in my life instead of God. No, God is. We're just glad to be part of his kingdom, part of his family. You know, people say, oh, God, you're my number one. You know, that's what I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, God is number one. But the one pastor said this, and I actually agree with me. God is not number one. Now, some of you are thinking, wait, you have something else number one? No, God is not number one at all. He is only one. And you have to understand that. We often think that God is number one and, and this is number two. No. God is everything. He is only one. There's no number two, number three. No. God, that's it. The, the reason I'm saying is this. When God is number one, which means there's number two, number three, number four, which means sometime when we are disappointed with God, we move on to number two. Oh, well, number one doesn't work, so I'm going to choose number two. And number one, number two becomes number one. Right? And then number three becomes number one. Number four. No, there's no backup plan. There's nothing after God, nothing before God. It's God. He is only God. And I don't know what people are trying to say. He is the priority, is everything. But we have to be careful. When we say God is number one, which means that God could be number two, three, four, five. No, there's no option. Either you choose God and He's everything, He's the only one, or it's not. And that's why I know some of you might not know Korean, but Korean word God is Hanani, which means what? Only God, right? It just, Koreans, I guess they already know that God is only God. And that's the beauty of it. He's not the best God out there. He's not the number, God, number one God of all other gods. No, he's only God. He's only one. There's no other alternative that even can even close to that. There's no options. And that should be our attitude. That will allow us to come before God and be still. Because if it's not God, there's no other plan. That's why we will go to God. Just like little kids, when, when they're in trouble, like five-year-old, they're not going to be like, okay, let me call and figure it out. No, they're going to just go, run to their parents because for them, parents are the only ones that they could go to. There's no other thing. They don't, in their mind, there's no, no other, right? They will just come and what? They cry. Mom, Dad, this is what happened. You need to help me, right? Or for us, God, wait there. I'll be there with you. Let me figure it out. Right? That's what happens with us. 
He's the only option. He's the only choice. It's either God or nothing. That's what our attitude has to be. That's why we have to see how great, how awesome our God is and only Him. There's nothing. There's no, nothing to we could turn to or see or experience. Well, still, why do we have to really be still and, and we don't know where God is? No. Psalm 46 ends with this. 11 says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And we know that through Jesus Christ, God's message is that God is with us. Emmanuel, right? Do you believe this? God is our God, only God, our Lord, our Savior. If he is, he is our Lord, our Savior, our God, then who should be leading your life? Still you? Still me? No. That's why we need to have this spiritual pause moment. Whether it's every day, every hour, whenever you try to turn your, yourself away from God, you need to pause for that moment. Stop, drop everything, and then know our God and see what God is doing. Because God is still working in our lives. Amen? He still works, whether you see it or not. Even today, I hear someone saying, tell me, I'm cancer-free. And I'm like, amazed. Wow. We've been praying, but sometimes we don't check. But there are people, and, and I know today we have some, another person that's supposed to be here, but I don't think he's here today. But we have someone who recovered from double lung transplant, right? He already discharged. Doctor said he'll be here another week, but discharged because maybe, maybe you guys are praying too, too much that just got rushed and there's so much healing. So he's, I mean, it's great. I don't know if you realize, there's so many people in our congregation that went through different sickness and, and recover. And, and yeah, some of them went to be with the Lord, but we know that there's many of you experienced and, and still experienced, which shows what? God is at work, and we just need to see that, acknowledge that, remind ourselves, okay, I just need to be still and know that my God is only God, who is a true healer, true guide, true provider, and He is my Lord. No one else, nothing else. And that's what we need to be. Let us be still before God and know God. Let us acknowledge God as our only Lord, only Savior. So I hope that you'll be still and know that God is with you every single moment. The question is, are you with God every single moment? Let's all stand and let's just sing this song with our confession to the Lord. And let's just continue to come to the Lord. Acknowledge that He is our refuge, He's our Lord, that He will hide us under His wings. When the ocean
Father, there are people in this room still struggling with different issues and problems, and you know them all. And there are some of us who are going through a good day. And I hope and pray that all of us will come and acknowledge you, Lord, as our Lord and Savior, as we pause, as we stop. And as we drop our agendas and will and our plans and know you, Lord, know our God and see what you are doing in our lives and in this church, in this world, because I know that my God is at work every single moment, whether we see it or not. So, Father, allow us to pause, stop, again, sync with you to know to see your plan not only being carried out but continue to be prepared even for our futures so would you be the true God true Lord true Savior and only God in our lives that you will be the only one they will turn to as you're truly our refuge and strength and may the grace of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and the love of God the Father who gave his one and only son to us and the power and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us as we continue to be still and know that you are God and they will continue to see you being exalted among all nations that all will do be in all of your presence and continue to have you as our sinner as only God now and forever Amen